Talk to you later. Uh, my name is Ed Colger, and I have the pleasure and honor of uh, introducing our speaker. And we have some people coming in. Let them settle down. Before I finish our remarks, they'll be brief and I'll be gone. Uh, there's a right after the talk uh, on the other side of this uh, room. Okay, so don't forget the goodies there. Now, um, our speaker today uh, addresses a very nettle question. How do you uh, imagine the, the, the global studies in um, education and under conditions of globalization? To give some context uh, to this question, uh, I thought a brief poem uh, might capture the question that our speaker will be addressing. Now, the title is It's Easy to Lose Faith. Thanks. A horse and cart went past. I'll repeat it again so make sure you grasp what's going on. Imagine yourself the speaker of the poem. A horse and a cart went past. I see. I believe uh, in them. Um, they grow dark. The horse and the cart went past, but the horse had a horse. The cart had a cart. They led their own selves, large from shadow, along the acacia. And now it's hard for me to believe in the horse and cart. Uh, it's awful tough with so many clamoring and flashing voices of eight billion people now in a global society for the first time to know who to believe, right? Who uh, has the right answer? Uh, what are the right values? How do I know they're right? Well, fortunately today, we have a speaker who we can trust, uh, at least to address that question. Professor Rizvi is an emeritus professor of global studies in education at the University of Melbourne. And as some of you already know, he is emeritus from the University of Illinois here at Urbana-Champaign. He has written extensively on the issues of identity and culture in transnational contexts, globalization, and education policy. A sequel of his widely acclaimed book, Globalizing Educational Policy, was recently republished under the title, Reimagining Globalization and Education. Uh, he's still emeritus, but not retired because he is an editor-in-chief of the fourth edition of the International Encyclopedia of Education. Basil is currently researching educational reform in Bhutan, uh, dealing now with the, uh, with the uh, present leader of Bhutan. He is a fellow of the Australian Academy of the Social Sciences, past editor of the journal, Discourse Studies in uh, Cultural Politics of Education, and a past president of the Australian Association of Research and Education. Father, well, it's a great pleasure to have you. Thank you, Ed. Um, I'm actually delighted to have this opportunity to reminisce and describe uh, the last 25 years of my scholarship in and around the issues of globalization. Many of them were uh, pushed by uh, my appointment here. Uh, let me say something about my appointment here. I came here from Australia, uh, where I was at uh, Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. I had an administrative job as an associate provost uh, international. And uh, I came here largely as a result of uh, uh, the encouragement and indeed support of uh, my very good friend, uh, Earl Kellogg, who was an associate provost international here 
at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He had managed to persuade the university that uh, the university needed to internationalize by bringing in people from elsewhere to work on issues of globalization and internationalization. So departments were able to make applications to, I think it was called International Excellence Hire Program. Uh, I don't know the details, but uh, it had some grand title like that. Uh, anyway, um, my colleague, Nick Barbulis, uh, who i would known for quite some time, made the application that uh, he would like me uh, to come here. And um, um, luckily, I was appointed. And I came here uh, exactly 10 days before 9-11. Okay, so as a result, uh, it was a very interesting time to be in the United States uh, because 10 days were uh, with a great deal of enthusiasm and a great deal of excitement, followed by a lot of worry and a lot of concern. Uh, I was brought here on the same day under the same scheme as uh, my very good friend Jan Netherveen Peters in sociology department. So we arrived in exactly the same day and of course have since become very, very good friends. And he has influenced me greatly on the, my own thinking in whole range of ways. He has a very strange brain, which goes in all different directions, but in directions that give you cope, uh, reason to pause and think about issues in very serious ways. You don't always agree, and sometimes he fights and fights vigorously, but nonetheless, uh, he's an absolutely wonderful interlocutor uh, who is uh, who's really, really good to have a chat with. Indeed, each time I come to the United States, I stop over at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he is now, and uh, spend two days uh, uh, jousting with him about a whole range of ideas, and uh, it really is quite interesting to do that. Uh, um, I was brought here, and uh, just as I arrived, a very uh, distinguished scholar uh, called Professor Mohsin, who was an Afghani uh, economist uh, and, uh, and, and, and development studies person in education, had just retired. So that there was a vacancy in the department of EPS, Educational Policy Studies, as it was called then, now EPO, um, that, uh, that, that, uh, that was looking for somebody to teach his courses. Uh, comparative and international education. I could not teach economics, which he taught, economics of education, but uh, I had a go at comparative and international education. That was a new discipline to me. So I had to actually learn as quickly as I possibly can the traditions of that discipline and the ideas that uh, uh, framed his thinking. Um, he was human capital theory a guy who had uh, worked with World Bank and uh, indeed had done huge amount of development work in countries like Afghanistan, where he came from, as well as uh, Maldives and, uh, and Kenya and places like that. So he was a very different kind of person to me who had come from an ba academic background in philosophy of education. Uh, and that's how I knew um, Nick. But I had to become a comparativist almost overnight. Uh, and uh, that was an interesting challenge because it was a literature that I could both relate to, having lived in at least four countries before, but also uh, be find it deeply troubling as well. So, and I found the comparative education as a field of study deeply troubling. And I'll say something about why I found it so, so, so troubling. Uh, comparative education in early part of, uh, in around the turn of the century, was going through a huge turmoil as a result of uh, uh, all the literature that was coming on uh, the concept of globalization and analysis that were being presented on global networks and global uh, global uh, forces and global connections and global imaginaries. At the same time, post-colonial theories had become had become quite popular and were widely used in a whole range of departments. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, the notion of development itself, uh, which was quite fundamental to understanding comparative and international education, was deeply, deeply criticized by a whole range of sc uh, scholars. Some of you would know the work of Achura Escobar, who wrote about post-development studies. Uh, so development studies, comparative studies, and international studies, all of those areas were in turmoil. Okay, around the turn of the century, all of them. Okay, all of them. Their fundamental premises were being questioned, largely on the ground that they were methodologically nationalist. 
national, methodological nationalism, that they viewed the world through the prism of the state. Okay, so if you described education, then you described education in Cameroon as being contained within that country rather than with forces outside the country. And internationalization effectively became an idea that tried to understand how what goes on within the local and national systems relates to, is related to forces coming in from outside and going out to outside. As a result, there is a relationship and a complicated relationship between the local and the global that was being, uh, being, being. At the same time, the idea of globalization, which had become popular through the course of 1990s, was actually described and analyzed and defined in a whole range of ways in just about every discipline, from literary studies to war studies to peace studies to uh, sociology to anthropology. Everything was actually becoming uh, a, an area of uh, field of study that was affected by uh, and was attempting to define a major, def a major, major way in which ed education might be defined. I found myself within those debates. So when I started reading about comparative education, I had been for 10 years reading about globalization since the fall of the Cold War, effectively, in 1989. Um, and, 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 and I could not relate uh, how comparative education and international education at that time could remain almost silent on these scholarship and advances that were taking place. Uh, and yet there is no way that I could have taught it comparative and international education in the image or the register that Mosi did it. Okay, uh, not, not only because the notion of development was deeply problematic, but also because globalization literature had made comparative and international education a very different kind of beast than it had been before. So uh, I'm, I'm fighting against uh, a particular disciplinary tradition, but at the same time, trying to work with that tradition and sort of say, how can we transform this tradition into something else? Instead of assuming that everything that was done in comparative and international education was irrelevant and useless and, and, and superseded by the forces of globalization, I was actually sort of saying there is something that comparativists did, the detailed historical work that they did of particular countries and particular policies was still important and was a resource that uh, globalization people cannot it can ill afford to ignore. So basically, that was the major idea. So I needed to actually develop a program that, uh, that, that actually reflected some of my own doubts and some of my own thinking. But I was indeed very lucky because at that time, around the faculty, largely as a result of Earl's contribution to the university, which is, in my view, was hugely significant and should be acknowledged, okay? Uh, there, there were people, there were people that I could talk to around the university in various uh, departments, David Wilson in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, in, in, in geography, uh, people in, uh, uh, in uh, Anya Lumba in, uh, in, in English, et cetera, et cetera. And we formed quite a close knit group uh, um, and as a result started uh, exploring new ideas and new ways of uh, teaching about comparative education, but uh, in ways that reflected contemporary uh, developments as well as contemporary theorizing in and around the notion of global. At the same time, the idea of global <laughs> studies, which had existed way, way back to the 1960s, as Edward had reminded me so uh, many times, um, was becoming popular again either. And that's where I captured the notion of global studies. So basically, the story of my uh, develop uh, my role in the development of uh, global studies in education was a move from international comparative education to global studies. And of course, I found Ed and other people, uh, fellow travelers, in that journey. And so as a result, there was, a, there was an interesting time to do this. Uh, um, I managed to find and persuade some of my students that they might want to help me in thinking through these issues. So basically what we did was uh, bring a group of six people, including a faculty from, uh, from CNI called Brenda Tefanenko, who was interested in these issues. She was a Canadian and uh, was, was looking around for a new form. 
So between uh, two of us, two faculties, and four students, uh, uh, including Nicole Lamos, who is all sitting in the back, you know, there, who's become quite a distinguished ed internationalist herself, international educator herself. Okay, uh, we used to meet every Sunday night uh, and talk about these issues uh, at three levels. Uh, what are the ideas that we are engaging with that are helpful for us to think and rethink comparative and international education in the new register of global studies. That was one challenge. The other one is what kind of course might, courses, uh, subjects might we develop? Okay. Uh, and the third one was to have a good time while we are talking about it. And uh, I took uh, the responsibility of cooking my very, very bad Indian food, but they didn't know about Indian food, so they tolerated my bed. And they always said that was great food, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure my mom would have said, what a load of rubbish. <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, uh, they, they admired it and we had a good time. And the conversation became more and more serious um, uh, in, a, in, 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 in between a whole range of other things. Now, it became quite clear to us that if we wanted to develop a program in global studies in education, which is a decision we raised, and I tried with James, James Anderson, he said, go ahead and do it, okay? We wanted a program that didn't have discrete units, one here, one there, one on evaluation, one on research method, one on ethics, one on technology. We wanted to create a structure that was coherent, that was uh, that was uh, uh, that that was uh, co not only coherent but also uh, spoke to each other. So, so, the, the, so the core courses were so designed as to be developmental. So the the thing that was done in the first course fed into the second course, and the second course fed into the third course, and so on and so on. That was very important to us because we said if you are going to actually recast and reframe the field uh, of comparative energy. And that's how ambitious and cocky we were. Uh, if we were going to do that, then we needed to actually develop not only one course, one, one, one subject, but a whole suite of sort of courses that actually spoke to in a, in a coherent fashion, in a sequential fashion. So in other words, we applied the best principles of, of, of curriculum development and curriculum design. Uh, one of the things that we objected to was there were a large number of programs that uh, encouraged individuals, faculty, to teach this course or that course or that course, and there was no connection between those. We were absolutely insistent that there must be connection in the various courses that we develop. So that's actually what we decided to do. The next thing that we did was, was, to, was to get funding from, uh, from UNESCO of old. I had been working for UNESCO, OECD, and to a lesser extent, World Bank, uh, uh, but certainly OECD, I did a book in 2000 on globalization, uh, OECD, and educational policy making. Um, and as a result, I knew the organization pretty well. And also uh, UNESCO. Uh, and UNESCO very kindly through their, their Bangkok office, regional office, uh, gave us some money uh, that allowed me to employ people to actually have a look at what is being said in policy documents uh, in a number of different countries about globalization and its implications for education. Okay, so the, the project that uh, we got funding for from UNESCO was to actually look at policy documents in a number of countries of the past 10 years and have a look at what use they are making and how are they defining globalization and the ways in which they think that the new world requires, as a result of global processes, a new set of policies and practices. So that was the, that was the project. We produced a report that is still on, on the website, so if you want to have a look at it. It's uh, called Shifting Understandings of Globalization in the Asia Pacific. But it led us to actually develop some kind of understanding as to how globalization was being thought about not only in uh, academic circles, but also in the policy circles, in, in departments, okay? And that was important to us. We wanted to bring those two things together so that uh, we can... It became quite clear 
Then in uh, so we did uh, we did eleven countries their reports, and then we did some more countries outside the Asia Pacific: South Africa, uh, England, United States, Australia, etc., etc. As a way of uh, developing a understanding of what is being said about globalization in these policy documents, in these policy reports. What became clear immediately is the structure of the argument, the discursive argument across all of those nations was very similar, okay? They all expressed an, a huge amount of anxiety and about sense of crisis. They presented globalization as a challenge that needed to be met by educators and educationists. And they said globalization had opened up huge number of opportunities to finally transform education in a new image. Okay, so in other words, there was the negative and that there were positive in the reports. Both of those things were presented, but all of them use the language of crisis, not all that different to the language of uh, crisis, as was the case in that very important and famous document in 1980s called Nation at Risk in this country. Okay, it was very, very similar. And many of these people were talking about it. So what were they anxious about? Well, they, what, and what did they think globalization was all about? Okay. Well, to start off with, they said, uh, economy ain't what it used to be. It is becoming increasingly globally integrated, globally networked, globally. And as a result of that, modes of production, modes of ownership, modes of consumption, and modes of circulation of money is changing and changing very rapidly. And that is raising, raising some new issues that are opening up some possibilities. The third thing that they said was the nature of work and employment and labor relations are changing. And as a result, we are no longer preparing kids for certain kinds of jobs. Globalization and indeed technology has transformed them. So as a result, we cannot rely on the old curriculum to and see it as satisfactory in relation to the pressures and the opportunities and challenges associated with global life. Every report is saying this. Every report is saying that, okay? They're also saying that uh, mobility of people, ideas, and, uh, and, and money is going to become ubiquitous and expand and expand very rapidly. And as a result, what we've got to understand is uh, that mobility is going to become a new motif, if you like, uh, in and around global processes will proceed. In other words, mobility is something that is well worth studying. Okay, so those were some of the, and of course they, they pointed to the changing nature of, economy, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of technology and how technology, especially information technologies, were really transforming. Now remember, this is in late 90s and early, early 2000s. Okay, so this is around 20, 25 years ago. Okay, those are the things that people were saying. Okay. So what are the solutions that they provide? That's where there, there were some differences, okay? Different countries were proposing different kinds of solutions, but there were some solutions that were being embraced. And in embracing those solutions, they were drawing very heavily on the literature that was coming out of international organization, the World Bank, OECD, uh, IMF, uh, um, in other words, they, they, they were look at, uh, looking at international organizers. The other source from where they were getting many of these recommendations for what needed to be done in education as a result of global processes becoming ubiquitous was corporations. Okay, so as a result, they were talking about uh, Microsoft, uh, um, uh, all those uh, kinds of organizations. So things like 20th century skills, uh, that idea came about you know, from corporations as much as it came out from national policy processes or global or international organizations. Now, so so what are some of the things that they said that needed to be done? Okay, uh, the, oh, sorry, the, before I say that, the other thing that they all highlighted, especially in developing countries, okay, or countries of the global south, is uh, is that, uh, is that, is that, uh, that uh, number of students who will be going to universities, uh, is going to rise, rise, and rise very rapidly. In other words, they pointed to the massification of higher education sector, uh, uh, and they assumed that secondary education will be compulsory across all the time, across, across the entire um, five, six years of secondary schools. 
Okay, so basically massification. But they said the massification is going to have its problem. It's going to have a problem because it's going to put pressure on nation states to create new schools and new teachers, find new teachers and find uh, uh, new ways of teaching massified people. Not the elite 5% at university, but the 50% who will go to the university. And as a result, the demography of universities and schools will change. And that will give rise to a new politics of difference, uh, cultural difference. Okay, in other words, there'll be pressures from those people who were not part of higher education system or secondary education system in some countries will come in and they will make certain demands. And those demands will have to be treated. So much of the diversity and inclusion agenda from their perspective came from the recognition that massification, massification is something that really requires a major, major rethink so that uh, you can actually look at not only the students who, the number of students were, but the kind of students who be coming into the various uh, sectors of education. So that became a major, major concern for them. So basically, uh, something needed to be done to diversify the curriculum, to actually make the curriculum much more culturally responsive and gender responsive and all those sort of things that we now find 20 years later, absolutely familiar. But they were done in the context of massification of education. Okay, because then there is problem of uh, where, do you, where do you put these people? The example that I could give that best illustrates the problem of massification is this. Uh, I worked in Vietnam, Mary, Marian will, will know this, uh, uh, creating a new campus in, uh, in, in Vietnam. And I went there on a regular basis to negotiate the contract uh, to establish a new campus. And at that time, Vietnam was run by fairly strict communist government, not like now, but then they, they were really, really very, very uh, pure, if you like. Uh, why were they talking to us? Why would they be talking to a university abroad to establish a private campus? Although the university itself in Australia was public, its operations in Vietnam are private, okay? Why were they allowing a, a campus for 10,000 students? I couldn't figure it out, I couldn't figure it out, okay? So I had a meeting with Deputy, Deputy, Deputy Minister of Education, somewhere lower down the rung of ministers that they had, okay? And I said, why? He, he was educated in Australia, so he, he spoke openly and had Australian sensibilities in many ways. And I said, why are you doing that? He said, Father, I'm going to tell you the truth. Okay, in Vietnam in 2000, uh, sorry, in 1998, there, <coughs> there were 17 students matriculating from schools, and there was only one place for every 17 students. One place for every 17 students. One place, okay. In other words, 16, place, 16 students who graduate from high school with sufficient marks and ambition and aspiration to go to the university cannot find a place. What do we do about this? He said, we've got three options. One is we create universities. At that time, Vietnam was really poor, like not like now, it's a, it's a middle income country. Okay, but it was really poor. Uh, we have no capacity to build new universities. We can send them overseas. We've got no money to provide scholarship. We can send them to distance education as it was called then, online learning basically. Um, these students don't like online learning because they prefer to be in person, you know, and have the social relationships that are associated with it. So if we don't do something about that, okay, we will have 16 students unemployed quite often in the streets creating trouble for the state. Okay, <laughs> great. So we have to do something. So as a result, we have, as a government decided, we will let private players come in to establish campuses and establish various operations, largely as a way of uh, making sure that at least some of the students will have the capacity to go to university locally without having to go overseas, okay? Can you see the argument? And this is, if you like, a consequence from his point of view of massification. If you're going to expect not 3% of the students going to university, but 30% of the university, you know, in various space, where are the teachers? 
What are the possibilities? Yeah. So that actually was the problem that they encountered. So what were the what were the what, what what were the responses to this? Well, the responses were quite interesting, and there they borrowed very most of these organizer uh, national systems borrowed very heavily from the literature that was coming out uh, from World Bank, UNESCO to lesser extent, but uh, to greater extent OECD. Okay, OECD was incredibly influential. So references to OECD and the World Bank were scattered throughout the paper. And not surprisingly, the prescriptions and the solutions to the problem were in classical image of uh, neoliberal, um, neoliberal policy thinking. Okay, privatization, corporatization, vocationalization, audit culture, accountability, transparency, um, uh, uh, rethinking the curriculum, rethinking the pedagogy, using better use, making better use of technology, yeah, getting people familiar with the new conditions in which they will have to work. Enterprise, entrepreneurialism. You know the script, okay? That script has been now very, very familiar. But all of these reports were more or less pointing to that, while at the same time highlighting the importance of preserving their local traditions and local values, okay? Uh, without ever actually exploring how the two goals, preserving local, uh, local, uh, local uh, values and local traditions and uh, privatization of the kind that, that was being proposed may actually conflict with each other. Need not conflict with each other, but may. But that analytical issue was seldom, seldom examined. So basically, we read some of this literature. I read as many reports as I possibly can. And out of that, we said, we need to develop a course. There was no possibility of developing a course in on, uh, in on campus mode because there were not enough students here and we couldn't get enough students. We needed to get students who would not come to UI otherwise. So we basically decided that online was the only solution. And at that time there, there had already been two relatively successful online programs that were going. One of them was, an, was called CETA, um, I don't know what CETA stands for, but uh, Bill, as a historian, would know what CETA stands for. But Nick, Nick Berbulis uh, taught a course in that, okay? And the other one was uh, human resource development. Uh, that was another course there. And we talked to these people, the people who were teaching that course, and sort of said, how do you do it? Can you train us? Can we sit in your classes? Um, can, we, can, we, can you show us? Uh, you know, what are the issues? What are the things that we can overcome in all those? So we did a huge amount of work studying CETA and, uh, and a, a human resource development and sort of saying, how can we build on the, on, the, on the various? So basically, the way we decided was to make a use of Moodle, which was already being used, you know, and decided to have both synchronous and in asynchronous. Okay, there's a whole range of work that you did in the synchronous mode and whole range of work that you did in asynchronous mode. Okay, and together the, we, we developed our, 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 our very loosely defined pedagogy, although the pedagogy was such that it constantly evolved as we figured out new things and new, new, new tools became available to us. Now then the question came question of, okay, how do we decide on which six courses and how do we do it? The way we decided is so to say, what are the dimensions of global reports and the ideas that are absolutely essential for us to look at? And we came up with six, six major ideas. And these were policy, basically understanding the policy. And remember, we're in the Department of Educational Policy Study, so we cannot not do policy, so we did policy. The other one was curriculum. The third one was governance. Um, uh, the, the, the fourth one was technology. The fifth one was work and H HRD. And the fifth, the sixth one was identity, culture, and difference. Okay. So those were the concepts that we decided needed to have courses. Okay. And then on top of that, we said we would have a mobility experience and study mobility. Okay. So six. So we went around knocking at people's doors and saying, would you teach this course? in this particular way of thinking about it. So I decided to teach the course on policy. Brenda Tefanenko taught the course, the first iteration with uh, 
with the curriculum, and she was not in edu educational policy studies. So there were a few problems about how do you distribute financial resources and manage and all those sort of things, as you might imagine. So there was a problem with uh, Peter Kaczynski teaching a course on work and HD, work and labor relations and global economy and, uh, and uh, 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 HRD. Um, so there were problems, but we, we overcame came those. So uh, Brenda Tevlenko was curriculum, uh, Michael Peters, was governance, okay. Uh, Nick Bergulis was technology, pedagogy, and ethics. And, uh, and, and we had Peter Kuczynski on work, labor relations, employment, and human resource development, and identity and culture. We approached Antonia Dada to teach, but she didn't uh, have time or didn't want to or whatever. Um, and I turned out teaching that particular course as well. So basically, we managed to get fairly significant heavy hitters uh, to the extent that we could. And uh, when Brenda Tefneko could not do it any longer, we brought in Cameron McCarthy. So we had Cameron McCarthy, myself, Nick, Nick Bogulis, uh, 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 Antonia Dada, um, uh, sorry, uh, Peter Kocenti and, uh, and, uh, and Michael Peters teaching this course. And they constituted the, the Global Studies Program you, uh, faculty, if you like. Along with that, we managed to find something really, really interesting is uh, we decided that uh, we can't simply have an online program. We had to have a PhD program, not in ways all that different to the ways that Mary and Bill are doing it, that it is essential for to have a PhD program that is doing the research and all those sort of things, and, uh, 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 and, uh, and an online master's program that is largely teaching program. Okay, um, but but they're also being encouraged to do some research, but they 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 don't see themselves as following research career, whereas PhD students are. Okay, so that's the distinction that we draw. So basically, what I managed to do, which would not be possible anymore, is uh, persuaded the dean then before Mary, um, Susan Fala and Richard Herman, who was the who was. The, 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 the provost thing, that uh, some amount of money for this experiment should be set aside, set aside to pay for uh, teaching assistants who can become the PhD students associated with these courses. So every course of 30 students had two teaching assistants, one looking after the technology matters and one looking after the content and communication matters. So as a result, courses were being taught by three people. And I saw this as a method of cross-subsidization. We were cross-subsidizing the income generated from master's program into the PhD program. Okay, And as a result, creating a community that was really quite important. Uh, so that's actually how we did it. Uh, and that's how, that was the structure. There was a fees charge. But then we did something else. When we had figured out this, this architecture of this course, we decided to try it out on teachers. So we organized a workshop with champagne teachers, about seven or eight, who came and sat with us for about three hours. And we went through the program and got huge amount of feedback. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and as a result, fiddle around with the, whatever the program was. And then we took a, a, a large van and went to, uh, went to Chicago to do the same thing with Chicago teachers. Okay, so as a result, we had a pretty good understanding of what would be meaningful to students and what would not. Of course, there's never complete understanding, but sufficient understanding that was really quite useful to us uh, in uh, modifying uh, and, and, and even, even having a look at references and sort of saying, this, will work, this one will work and this one will work. It was great fun doing this exercise with teachers because all the uh, TAs now appointed about 10 of them and, uh, and, 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 the, and the six or seven teachers. We went out to dinner, we had lots of fun and all those sort of things. And as a result, out of this conviviality, which is an essential element of education as far as I'm concerned, out of this conviviality and hospitality emerged the course that we eventually taught. Okay, so that was basically the ways in which it, we did it. Uh, the, the courses ran really well. The response was absolutely incredible. Nicole will tell you that uh, you know uh, uh, there, there were students who were doing all kinds of interesting stuff and reading very widely, suggesting references to us back, and uh, and and engaging in discussions and conversation. 
What became clear to us is that there was desperate need at that time for such a course, okay? Because otherwise we would not have got them. We got students from around the world. Uh, there was a student from Saudi Arabia, uh, full burqa and all those sort of things, but absolutely strident in her opinions. Always Sakina, her name was, you would remember Nicole, um, uh, Sakina. She, she would, somebody would say something about Islam. Do you remember this is post 9-11 about Islam? She said, it's absolutely not true. You know, take it back, you know, that kind of stuff. She was incredibly good. And I think Nicole is still in touch with her. You know, so, it's, so that's it. And we're, we're in touch with a lot, a lot of those students. There was another student who was a Hollywood actor, uh, okay, and had, uh, uh, came second, isn't that right? Second. First, first, first in American Idol, you know, uh, he was one of our students, okay, and uh, he had done a master's uh, degree in special education, and he had just been appointed as a result of this celebrity status uh, and, at, at, uh, at, as a UNESCO ambassador. Okay, so he decided to take our course. Where he heard about it, I have absolutely no idea because we did no advertising at all. It was all word of mouth. Okay, no advertising at all. And at that time, of course, uh, the, the college was not known for its online programs uh, in a way that it is now. Okay, so it really was quite interesting. And this student uh, was a bit of a problem because everybody would have known his name because he was, uh, I'm not allowed to say his name even now. Okay, um, he was so famous and so, so, so. Uh, so prominent. So we gave him a pseudonym. I think Nicole gave him a pseudonym, probably Michael Jones or something like that, something something totally nondescript. <laughs> okay. And uh, as a result, he was a very good student and he participated every time until he got a major role in Broadway uh, in the theater, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a musical. And uh, he had to leave the program halfway through. Anyway, those are the kind of things that happen that, as a result of the development. I've probably spent too much time talking about that because I want to go move on. Um, around 2007, 8, and 9, problems began to emerge, not only in relation to our understanding of the program, which was running very well, okay, but in relation to the concepts that we were communicating and the enthusiasm which we portrayed globalization as being something that was really a positive thing towards a cosmopolitan future, okay? In other words, we recognized that we did not consider sufficiently the various critiques that were also available. That it was no way that we could do that for two reasons, two reasons in particular. One, GFC came along, and GFC really threw Spanner in the book in the nar narrative that we had developed, okay? Because we realized that the neoliberal globalization that we were not critiquing to the extent that it should have been, okay, could not any longer be critiqued, could not be left untouched. That's, that was one thing. The other thing that has happened that is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is these little things that we've got in all our hands, the little uh, iPhones and iPads came along. Okay, that was in 2007. Um, I think it was Tim Cook who went and sort of said, this is an iPad, this can do these things. You know? And all of a sudden, we had to figure out what are its implications? What kind of data is going to be collected? What kind of issues might it, uh, might it raise? What kind of, what kind of uh, possibilities does it open up? And of course, in many ways, uh, Bill and Mary's course is actually taking our suspicions to another huge level, okay? But those were our concerns. Our concern, uh, not only concerns, but also uh, our imagination was running wild. We would get together and sort of saying, okay, we've got this thing called iPad. We've got this thing called iPhone, I I I iPhone. You know, each time we go there, you know, we are recorded and all those sort of things. You know, what kind of privacy issues is this raising? What kind of commerce is it going to? So all of those things that we talked about, the nature of economy, nature of work, nature of, uh, of uh, social relations, nature of state, all of those things were destabilized, okay, in, 19, in 2008, 2009. And this actually created a huge problem for us. How do we teach the program and whether the program needed 
huge range of uh, of modifications. Okay, not the structure that we had, but it needed to change quite substantially to take into account of those two things. But there were other things that were happening in the world that was also um, uh, of concerns to us, you know, uh, including the emergence of the literature on decolonization. All of a sudden, phew, it was everywhere. And we had to actually deal with it in a way that even Cameron McCarthy, who speciality it was to examine those issues, had not done. Okay. So as a result, all these new theoretical, practical, political, and policy issues are emerging. And we've got to rethink globalization. And we've got to think about a new idea of globalization, a new way of thinking about globalization. So uh, I left before these questions got addressed or resolved in 2010 um, and uh, basically have observed the program from a distance now. Okay, it's a very, very different program. But my own view is that some of the issues that are now emerging, okay, are absolutely crucial to understanding globalization. And as a result, in 2020 to 21, uh, I produced, we produced this little book called Reimagining Globalization and, 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 and oh, where is it? <laughs> oh, did I give it to somebody? No, oh, it has disappeared. Sorry. On the table there? Oh, no, that's the, oh yeah, under, under sorry, beg your pardon. <laughs> uh, there it is. Okay, uh, so basically it, uh, uh, it's called Reimagining Globalization. And basically I would read the, the back cover. This book brings together leading scholars in global studies and education to reflect on how various developments of historic significance in recent years have unsettled the neoliberal imaginary of globalization. These developments include greater recognition of inequalities and the changing nature of work and communication, the emergence of new technologies of governance, datification, et cetera, et cetera, AI, et cetera, a greater awareness of geopolitical shifts and tensions, the revival of nationalism, pandemics, well, sorry, nationalism, populism, and anti-globalization sentiments, and the recognition of risks associated with pandemics and the climate change, okay? In other words, uh, conditions are changing, okay? We've got to think and rethink globalization differently. And that's actually what the argument of this book is. I don't think it succeeds in presenting an alternative view of globalization. Nonetheless, it actually puts on table the, on the agenda uh, some of these issues that have to be thought about. So just as in 2002, 2003, we developed a view of globalization that was consistent with the reports that come out, that then came out, now we are living in a huge era of considerable social turbulence and much more rapid change than was the case even 20 years ago and even 10 years ago. So if we are going to take the notion of globalization seriously as a dynamic thing and not only something that is empirically out there, okay, then we've got problems. Okay? We've got to teach very differently about globalization. We've got to teach it in a highly, highly dynamic manner, okay? Where we're taking our people's ideas and people's experiences and incorporating them in our, in our, in our, in our curriculum and in our pedagogy and in our evaluation. Uh, because every aspect of education is potentially affected. Every aspect, pedagogy, evaluation, governance, policy, you name it, identity, culture, all of them are affected. Okay, so as a result, what, uh, what we are now seeing is even stronger case for globalization to become integrated, but in ways that is radically different to the ways in which we did it in 2001 and 2010. Okay, so the question really is, how do you deal with the dynamics of globalization? How do you deal with the rapid changes? Of course, you might say, the best thing to do is to actually go inward into within ourselves, within our nations, and within our communities. Now that's all very well at a rhetorical level, and you will see that throughout this, uh, this, this year in, a, in, in, a, in, the, in, the, in the presidential elections this year, okay? That particular sentiment is going to be presented over and over again. Why we are involved in Ukraine? Why we are involved in, in, in Gaza? Why we are involved around the world? And why, uh, what, what has it got to do with us in simple ways, you know? 
The problem, of course, is that many of these things are shaping our localities, are shaping our, uh, our, our, our uh, everyday, every, everyday life and all those sort of things. So it's all very well to say that we can go inwards. The question is, is it possible to go inwards? Okay, and that makes it really, really very difficult for the thing for us to look at. Uh, to my mind, uh, uh, anti-globalization sentiments are easy to express, but much more difficult to establish and indeed to, to ignore. You know, so globalization is there and probably going to accelerate uh, in terms of the global networks that are going to emerge and global uh, 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 global relations that are going to emerge and global forces that are going to become more and more intense. I mean, something like uh, the technology that we have now become completely used to it, that's changing at a very, very rapid rate and changing in ways that is affecting every aspect of our lives, okay? And if that is so, then we cannot actually honestly provide an education to students that are not unaware of these issues. They don't have to be, they have mastery over it, but they have to actually understand the issues and they have to actually sort of see. Luckily, quite often, uh, the, as I was saying to Bill earlier on, uh, that uh, teachers, because they're engaging with the students on everyday basis, okay, are much more aware of these changes that are taking place and how they're affecting their the, the kids' uh, kids' lives than teacher educators are. Teacher educators are in fact be, uh, a few, 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 few steps behind. So exactly how you teachers can, teacher educators can catch up and develop courses in which these issues are not peripheral, okay, or for specialists, but are integrated into 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 the into the into the structure of uh, our our teaching and practice and learning um, that is to me the one of the really really quite a fundamental issue so the lesson that i can uh, communicate to you now is uh, that it was tough work for us to develop globalization um, and uh, uh, global global studies course and we did it with the help of a huge range of people, not only in education, but across the campus, including Ed and his Global Studies Center, and including uh, Ed, uh, uh, Earl and, uh, and other people. They were all contributing to us, okay? And as a result, we were, we were open. We were open to the extent of saying, where, where can we get these ideas? What can we in what we, what we can we can we do to enrich our courses so the experience that we are providing and the questions and the issues that we are raising with the students are as contemporary as they possibly can be okay as uh, as, as as profoundly meaningful as they possibly can and I think that's the challenge in a, and of course as changes take place at a much more rapid rate it becomes a harder and harder task so exactly how you deal with the with these issues is uh, is really something that uh, that uh, that to my mind is uh, very important uh, for us to consider. Um, my own view is that there are two ways of thinking about it. One is to change and have a some kind of commission every three to five years of uh, of, uh, of a group of people who look at our global studies in education programs, so saying, what is still relevant, what needs to be transformed. What needs to be changed? That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is to say that uh, we need to develop, we need to develop a mode of pedagogy, mode of teaching in which uh, the whole thing is not driven by, 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 by assumptions of stasis, but dynamism, okay? With dynamism, okay? That the world is dynamic and education must be too. Okay, well, and that is a tough, tough challenge because we've been taught, you know, uh, as a, in, a, in more or less the banking way, you know, we bank this, we bank this, we bank this. That metaphor doesn't make any sense any longer, okay, because the chain, what we are banking is no longer relevant as soon as it's banked, okay. So those kind of questions become really quite a quite urgent and quite important. So those are two approaches. Maybe we need to have approaches. But the other thing that I want to say in relation to global studies in education course, if I were doing it again, okay, what I, what I, would, what I would be doing is uh, insisting that uh, we do not go down the road of uh, uh, pick and choose, selectivity, 
Okay, uh, so students can choose this, 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 this. Uh, we provide them with a smorgasbord. Okay, in order to get grounded and serious understanding of these issues, we have to have coherent and sequentially designed uh, curriculum, which is precisely what we teach in CNI. Okay, we have to practice what we preach. Okay, so in other words, core courses that actually provides the grounding against which uh, um, selections can be made for electives. That's the way to go about it, rather than to do it uh, and to assume that the entire course can be pick and choose. Uh, I think we do students disservice when we do that. Uh, um, and uh, basically, the randomized approach to doing a master's degree, I think, uh, is, uh, is, of course, good for credentialism, but not very good for good education. Thank you very much. Please direct your questions directly at Fez, you will uh, presumably. Of course, that, that, that's a general idea. <laughs> Please um, uh, address your question directly to Fez. On comments. Let's not be bashful, come on. <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah. uh, here, stay. Uh, Hi. Uh, thank, thank you very much for your presentation and apologies for getting here a little bit late uh, because of back to back meetings. Um, thank you very much for all of the work that you do. I actually teach one of your chapters in my global studies course. So right. Good. And I appreciate that. And so do my students. My question for you, and you may have addressed this earlier, I have a couple. But the first one is how would you differentiate a global studies and education program? from a comparative and international yes. education program? Yes, yes. Uh, it's, very, it's a very good question. Uh, the field of comparative and education, I'm not, and I'm just coming from a CIES conference Same in my end. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, so, so I, I know that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that association, and I think things have changed and changed quite dramatically over the years. To my mind, the fundamental notion that differentiates those two traditions is uh, focus on relationalities, okay? Focus on trying to understand what is the nature of the relationship between the work of international organization and the work of national governments. And then what is the nature of the relationship between national government and local schools, okay? In other words, I absolutely want to focus on, uh, on, on, on not attempting to understand a national system within its own terms. So as soon as I look at a policy from coming out of Canberra, which is the capital of Australia, okay, or of Washington, or, or of uh, Singapore, the question I say, where has it come from? Okay, where are the ideas have come from? Okay, in other words, we try to uh, historicize and spatialize understanding of policies and practices immediately. You know, understand, where it's come from, and uh, both historically, what has been what has it been built upon, and also what uh, what how how is it linked to what other countries are doing? So you can argue that uh, policies in uh, uh, in education are converging. I don't think that is right. Okay, I think they're converging to certain extent, but in ways that are different. Okay, from each other. Okay, uh, so the divergence and convergence is happening at the same time. Okay, and this, those kind of new questions that we need to look at as being the center of understanding the difference between C uh, uh, comparative and international education and indeed, uh, uh, indeed uh, global studies. Uh, I remain committed to the idea of global studies as opposed to international and comparative education. And I have tried within that society to make as much noise as I possibly can to get them to change their society's name. They're not going to do it, you know, because there's a long history and their people are absolutely wedded to it. In any case, some of the people don't really buy some of my arguments, so that's understandable, okay? Um, and, uh, and, 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 uh, but I do think that there is a strand of CIA, uh, comparative and international education that is very mindful of the kind of questions that I find. I have lived in four different countries and probably have worked in 20 others, okay? And as a result, I find it very difficult to look at a policy purely in terms of 
this country or Turkey or Lebanon. You know, I all I'm always asking questions. What is the colonial history? Okay, that has given rise to this policy. I'm working in Bhutan, and I'm I'm constantly finding examples of how Bhutanese policies are affected by New Delhi. And our policies in New Delhi are affected by international organizations, including World Bank, and how it is affected by the history of colonialism. Those questions are much more important to me than the question of what is the structure of policy and what are the priorities. Uh, an intellectual exercise in this particular space really is about uh, historicizing, um, looking at criticality, uh, looking at relationality, doing self-reflexive work, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So try to understand policies, not only in terms of the text, okay, but trying to understand the discourses and the institutions that contribute to it. Bob, sorry. Uh, Bob. Thank you. Stay. Thank you. Professor Stay. Thank you. you. You've spent the hour Worshipping adaptation, specification in circumstance, in looking at what is the world around mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And then at the very end, mm -hmm. you make a pitch for mm -hmm. core studies. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there isn't something that is pure core studies or yeah. pure adaptation. Yeah. But If you look at the history of education, mm -hmm. some of us mm -hmm. think we've made terrible mistakes by investing in core, core education, that the community, that the world stays the same. Yeah. Now, how can you make this pitch for yeah, core yeah, studies yeah. when you've just worshiped the idea of specification to circumstance? by worshiping, worshiping a different kind of core, to the core that you're thinking of. Uh, okay, um, uh, my very good friend, Malcolm Skilbeck, who you probably know, actually, uh, who died, unfortunately, just recently. Okay, um, he and I, he lived very close to where I lived, constantly talked about core. He was disillusioned with his own historical work on core. He was member of CDC, Curriculum Development Corporation in Australia. Uh, you know, and uh, then from there he went to uh, Deakin University, and from there to uh, to uh, to OECD. And he was always, and he he was a disillusioned core enthusiast. Okay, and I kept on saying, saying that Bob, the notion of core itself can be interpreted in a number of different ways. Okay, there is core that is the universal essential core. Okay, and there is the core where you look at ideas, okay, with their changing meaning, having to be having need, needing to be investigated in order to do that, because otherwise you get randomness. So I'm I'm actually fighting randomness, okay, which is I'm afraid quite ubiquitous in a market culture. Okay, I'll buy this, I'll buy this, I'll buy this. As a result. The students leave without a structured understanding of anything. Okay, so to me, I use that notion of core largely to refer to those concepts. So when we developed those six ideas, way way back in two thousand and three and four, okay, we didn't say what went into those courses in relation to technology, but we said in order to understand the world as we experience it, we've got to actually have some understanding of each of those themes or components. So to me, it's the thematic core rather than content core. I don't know whether that helps or not, but I think you're absolutely right in pointing to the tension between those two. Mary. Thank you. Um, it's very interesting to hear that history, mm -hmm. but I think in the academy, Generally, not just in ours, we have a new crisis. Yeah. Because a lot of what curriculum is, is information transmission yeah. and some administration. Mm. The dynamic intellectual work that you talked about yeah. in creating this product yeah. or this 
experience mm. and the resources it took, right? The money from your grant or the money from campus yeah. or the interdisciplinary collaboration, yeah. the time to think. Yeah. Somehow that yeah. is not uh, facilitated mm -hmm. by who we are mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how work gets distributed within our own environment. Sure. I don't know whether it's just post-COVID, yeah. no, no. but the possibilities yeah. for that communal, dynamic intellectual work yeah. doesn't seem to be a priority yeah. in leadership. It doesn't seem to be a priority in resourcing, yeah. right? It's we have we just do information transmission even when the world requires that we rethink almost everything that we have to yeah. right this moment. What generative AI has done, yeah. uh, what the crisis is around the world, almost every domain needs it, yeah. and yet we have settled into this yeah. information transmission yeah. Yeah. and administrative yeah. sharing of roles. Yeah, sure. How do we get out of that? Uh, Sorry, with, with, no, no, with, 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 a, with a great deal of difficulty. <laughs> but uh, but, uh, but I, I think that we can get out of it. Uh, it's something that we cannot give up on. Okay. Uh, no, but uh, let me, let, uh, the, uh, I tell you what, uh, um, despondency has become a part and parcel of our engagement with the world. <laughs> you know? um, how, uh, it's interesting, you know. Uh, I personally think it's not COVID only. I think many of these things predated COVID. Yeah. Okay. Many of those problems predated COVID. Okay. And they came about as a result of massification, as a re result of neoliberal governance, and as a result of uh, the ways in which we have structured universities uh, as, uh, as entities, not for learning per se, but for some other purposes. Okay. So as a result, uh, our very definition of university has shifted, okay? So much so, and also of course, what we've done with curriculum is we have got into got it into bite-sized pieces, okay? And as a result, you know, certificate and sub-certificate and sub-certificate and sub-certificate have become really quite common, okay? We have, if you like, uh, been driven uh, by credentialism in the ways in which those critics of credentialism in the 1960s and 70s didn't talk about. You know. This is a different kind of credentialism. And as a result, the students come with certain expectations, especially international students, okay? And as a result, they want to process, go through a particular set of experiences as predetermined, okay? Through their imaginary of what the university is and what the university should do, okay? And as a result, uh, there are this. This is not problem of, only problem of resources. It's a problem of imagination. It's a problem of analysis. It's a problem of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of of uh, of economics. You know, and so all of those problems are together. You know, so the challenges that we face in universities um, are, are 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 product of all of these things working upon each other in a highly highly uh, unhelpful ways. So despondency, yes. How do you get out of it? I personally think uh, little experiments here and there. The, uh, if we think that we can't move until the whole structure has been transformed, we are in hiding to nothing. I agree with that. <laughs> okay. uh, we are hiding, or even smaller structures might change. As I, so the, basically what can, we can do is sort of saying, it, I mean, there is no way that I would have been able to persuade the College of Education, or even EPS, okay, that this course should go in the direction it did. There is no way, I know that. But we had decided we are happy enough to work with those five people. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, uh, the core, it seems to me the core is a function, at least in some major degree, as a function of the power and security of preconditions of its definition in terms of its education, specifically uh, your Vietnam experience. Yeah. Uh, yes, we want the kids to be able to work in a market. Yes, yeah. we want the kids to, in effect, uh, be able to manage a unruly population. Yeah. And they have to have organizational skills uh, for that. Yeah. Um, uh, China is a better case. Yeah. Uh, globalization 
from the point of Xi Jinping is going to be radically different than uh, um, what we find here in the gaggle of discussions here in the United States. Yeah, yeah. And so the question is, aren't there fundamental and uh, uns, uh, and um, uh, boundaries that can't be vaulted unless you also uh, face in the education of uh, core studies, yeah. the limits posed yeah. essentially by power and security. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the ways in which uh, the interior of the cause, remember, I'm talking about thematic cause, not core, the con what goes inside it, what gets discussed under the rubric of issues of identity and culture, let's say. You know, they have to have discussions of geopolitical tensions, the political rhetorics of various kinds about security and otherwise. OK, now, remember, when I was thinking about these issues, about global studies, it was immediately after war. And I was doing it somebody who was potential. My middle name is Abbas. OK, my middle name is Abbas. OK, this was a difficult time. OK, in relation to security. And my thinking was constantly steered towards questions of security and questions of safety and questions of geopolit geopolitical conditions and geopolitical tensions. Constantly, you know. So as a result, the examples that I was giving in my globalization and education policy course, you know, were derived out of my own sense of anxiety Okay, about living in the United States in, uh, in, in 2002, 2003, 2004. Okay, so I think, I think those details, the, but you know, as educators, we also have to have some view of the structure. Okay, some view of what is it that uh, are the main coordinates within which we are talking about issues of uh, issues of uh, issues of power issues of security issues of geopolitical uh, conditions and etc cetera, etc cetera. you know uh, so basically the courses the six courses that we developed were really the coordinates which defined the shape within which each of those people were trying to actually explore the the the, 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 the and were doing the teaching i mean i don't know what they were doing in their classrooms i wasn't there but I was personally, and Nicole would be in a better, better position to say that because she actually attended a number of people, a number of classes, okay, as to how they were dealing with these, this narrative that I've presented to you. But that's the narrative that we developed, the six of us, okay? And we convinced our colleagues that then, but what they do and how they explore the issues still was in, entirely up to them. Yeah. Oh, so thanks for coming back. And for your rich discussion and experience. We appreciate you. Thank you, Alex. Sharing all of that with us. Um, good to know our investment paid off. Oh. <laughs> um, I did, a few years ago, a phone survey of vice chancellors in Africa. Yeah. Sort of saying, what are your challenges and what are your, uh, of universities, uh, vice chancellors of universities in Africa? Um, the overwhelming challenges that they articulated was that they've got this huge 18-year-old cohort of people coming through coming into the university. Mm -hmm. Africa's population growth 18 years ago was rather high, and it's that bulge is going through. Secondly, women are becoming much more possible for higher education because of different rules of marriage and employment and income, then you've got all this distance education kind of possibilities. Mm -hmm. And all of that was, but the thing that they talked a lot about was they had a whole different structure from the from their governments than before. Mm -hmm. That they were getting a rather large portion of their higher education budget from Ministry of Education and other places. Mm -hmm. Now that was dwindling significantly, mm -hmm. and they had to all of a sudden think of fundraising and foundations and all of this. So the whole world was changing under their feet, mm -hmm. and um, and they said, "We don't know what to do." Frankly, mm -hmm. and so this notion of of leadership development. I think one of the 
keys to changing things is mm -hmm. trying to help leaders yeah. understand and become more creative, et cetera. And I'm not talking about just leaders of universities, but I'm talking about leaders of ministries of education and, and so forth. You go from there to Korea and Japan and you do a phone survey of the leaders of higher education institutions, you get a different picture. Yeah. I'm sure they're looking for students and their population. Some We have 22 countries in the world are having dwindling population. population, yeah. Right. So this incredibly diverse mm -hmm. higher education picture emerges. Uh, it's always been diverse, but it seems to me it's getting even more critical. And and it's, we, we need much more creative kind of solutions. Is there a way in which we ought to be thinking of how to help develop leadership in ministries and higher education institutions for this mm -hmm new phenomena and these global challenges that we all face, quite different depending on the location you're at. Sure, sure, How would course. you go about thinking well, about that? I'd say a million dollar question, not even 65,000, 64,000 dollar question. Um, there's a wonderful book uh, that I'm not sure whether you looked at uh, by a, a Columbia professor of African background, of uh, Ugandan background, of Indian Ugandan background, I might say, uh, called Mahmoud Mundani. Okay, he wrote a very interesting book uh, on his experiences as the Dean of Humanities at Makerere, okay, in Kampala. Okay, really, really, really very interesting book, well worth reading, okay. And uh, he basically described some of his challenges. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I've got to tell you, the self-reflexivity and criticality uh, that was, that's evident in this book is truly inspiring, okay, to me anyway, because he's sort of saying, here are the pressures, not only of the new world, but of the old world, the colonialism, okay? And you are kind of crunched as a meat between in the sandwich, okay? Uh, and, and at the, the institutional level, there are pro-vice chancellors and there are vice chancellors, and then there are lecturers and um, faculty, and Dean is caught right in the middle of it, crunched again. Mm -hmm. So he basically describes a story of multiple crunches, <laughs> multiple meats and sandwiches. Okay, and his idea is that uh, that of course these problems are emerging of massification of universities uh, being directed by the by the their ministry to perform in a certain way, and if they have a loan from World Bank, then its requirements. I mean, world is structural adjustment is gone, but it's still there. We know that uh, you know, and Washington consensus is not quite dead, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. And, uh, and, 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 and so you're working in this very, very complicated space in uh, Africa. I work at the University of Pretoria uh, in, in South Africa. Of course, South Africa is distinctive compared to other parts of South. Uh, and I talk to the, the pro vice chancellor uh, teaching and learning there every so often, you know, just a cup of coffee and things like that. And the pressures he feels are absolutely incredible. Yeah. And one of the pressures he's feeling is, uh, is that we have given students a voice that they didn't have before, and they're exercising it. And given and give, we have given students a voice that they didn't have yeah. before, okay? And they're exercising it. It is actually becoming quite significantly uh, worrying for, for him. So the roads must fall, and, uh, and, and decolonization movement is not driven by theorists, it's driven by, by students. Okay, so he says, we are just seeing the consequences of where we have found ourselves through some of our own decisions, which were perfectly justifiable, but they have had their consequence, they're now open. So as a result, and, and, and just about everything that you said needs to be understood in terms of its antecedent and its other conditions. So, for example, why do ministers have certain expectations? Because of some reasons. We need to understand those reasons, both historically as well as in the contemporary politics. Okay, so I think that's the problem. Now, now uh, I've just come back from Japan three months ago, and uh, I went to a number of universities, and I, 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 I hear them describe some of the same problems, despite the... Uh, <laughs> the, the dwindling population, you know. Um, so, 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 so the similarities are there too across systems which are very, very different. I mean, in Korea, 
Apparently, gross enrollment rate is uh, rate, rate is now one hundred and three percent. There are more students who are studying universities. That's because there are you know people who are doing two or three degrees at simultaneously. Okay, so as a result, you know more than hundred percent of the population is doing or the cohort is doing higher education. What's going to happen to these people? You know, we have pushed access and equity and all those agenda very hard. But uh, we haven't thought through as to what's going to happen to these people once they graduate and once they have certain expectations. I hope all of you can now uh, join me in thanking Professor Very good. Thank you. And there is a reception on the other side of this room, so we can also uh, enjoy each other's company. Good to see you. Great to see you.